For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing thunder of and the joints and and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your... Let me ask you this. If your soul and your spirit are one and the same, how could they be divided? The reason why I want you to understand is because a lot of people think my spirit will do it. God put it in my spirit. And what you don't understand is your soul's keeping it from doing it. Your mind, will, and emotions are too wild. You won't control your own mind. So what God reveals to your spirit, your soul is beating it out of it. Because you keep measuring it through your intellect. God told me I can go across the Red Sea. Great, let's do it. Well, wait a minute. What are we going to do? The Red Sea is there and I can't swim. There's mountains on every side. Pharaoh's army is breathing down my neck so hot I can feel it. The soul says, you're done. The soul says, you're going to die. How you measure things. That's why if you don't get your mind straight and possess your soul and keep your soul from affecting your spirit, because he just said, they go so close to each other, like joints and marrow. And it's the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In other words, the only thing, please, 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 hear me. The only thing that can get your spirit and your soul in line with each other is the word of God. Hi, and welcome to Stone Point Community Church, where your life is made better. Thank you for listening to our podcast, and thanks for supporting the ministry. If you enjoyed today's message, why don't you be a blessing and share it with a friend? We appreciate you and pray for God's very best in your life. Mark chapter 4, verse 13. He said unto them, Know ye not this parable, and how then will you know all parables. Keep going. Verse 14. The sower soweth the word. And these are they which are sown by wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan does what? And taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in and so endure but for a time afterward when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in do what? And it becomes. These are they which are sown on good ground, such as do what? And they, and some what? Some, and some a hundredfold. Then he goes on verse 24. And he said unto them, take heed what you hear with what measure you meet. It shall be measured to you and unto you that hear shall what? More be given. So now let's understand that he is saying that word take heed, it means to see. In other words, it means to experience. It means to receive the word and heed the word. In other words, um, I can hear you and not be listening to you. But to listen is to hear with thoughtful attention. In other words, you got my focus or my eyes are on you. You ever heard somebody say, I just can't see it? Like if you, you, when you talk to somebody about their salvation and the truth of their salvation saying that even if I'm crazy, messed up, uh, did all kinds of hurtful things, bad things, God still loves me. People tell you, I just can't see that. Well, we know you can't see it because you can't see it until you've been born again. 
you're not going to be able to see it until the love of God is shut abroad in your hearts. You're not going to be able to see it until you recognize that God on the inside of you has never judged you for anything. The world has already been judged. God already sent his son to die in your place. The verdict has already been cast. The sentence has already been given. And Jesus is, in fact, the one who bore all of your pain, all of your sickness, all of your weakness, all of your inabilities. Jesus has already settled the debt. So when people talk about, well, you need to be in a deliverance ministry. Deliverance is Jesus. Whom the sun sets is So then a lot of times what happens is based on how we see what we saw and how we hear and see, people say, well, I just can't see that. Well, here's the problem. That's why you're not walking in it. Because there's a lot of times when people are preaching and they'll say, oh, pastor, I'm just thinking. Quit thinking. See it. (laughs) Don't just hear it. Remember when Jesus went and preached in his own country, he said the prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, among his own people. He said he could not do. This is the son of God, God in the flesh, and he couldn't do a miracle. Why? Because the people didn't believe. Are you following me? And so because they couldn't see it, he couldn't do it. I need you to understand this. He said, because the measure in which you meet what is being said to you, the measure in which you uh, give credit to what you hear God say to you, he said, that's the way God will give it back to you. If you believe that God is a healer, he is your healer. Look at, uh, look at Romans ten fourteen. Hello, Stone Point family. It's very easy to give online. You can either scan the QR code Give us a call in the office, leave a message, and we'll get back to you. Or visit us at scc.church, fill out the required information, click donate, and you're done. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear? Notice, he says, how do they call on him in whom they have not And how shall they believe in him whom has not presented himself? That's not what it says. People think, Holy Ghost, fix it. Where did you get that from? Holy Ghost doesn't fix anything without you. (laughs) He requires you to be a yielded vessel. That's why when he talks about Yield yourselves unto righteousness. You know what he's saying? Respond to righteousness. You know, it's real easy. We, when we've been traveling, it's been hard to, to get with my personal trainer because we've been traveling. You know, it's real easy to stop working out. It don't take no... But then I get back and we like trying to schedule. and It's like, oh my God, here we go. Got to go back and do this. See, what you yield yourself to, what you respond to. And a lot of people don't understand the reason why oppression happens in their life. Listen, a believer cannot be possessed. But a believer can be oppressed. And demonic entities can come and come and come and attack a person even though they're a believer. And they're always, as long as they believe in Jesus, they always have the ability to respond correctly. What's wrong? It's very simple to give online. There are only five steps to follow. Step one, go to our website, www.stonepointcc.org, or for short, scc.church. Step two, then click on PayPal or donate icon located at the top of the page. Step three, you can ask for whatever amount you desire to give. After you have done so, click the donate option down below. Step four, on this page, you have to notate what you are giving for, where it says add a note. Whether it's tithing, offering, building fund, love offering, guest offering, or so on. Step five, fill out the required details, then scroll to the bottom of the page and click donate now. And you're done. 
Hallelujah. <laughs> Devil be mad, don't he? <laughs> Such a simpleton. Whew. Good Lord. So then, when he says, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Then what brings about belief? Hearing. And how are they going to hear without somebody to proclaim it? And I want you to be very clear. A preacher, they're not referring to a preacher as in the fivefold ministry. Because it's not shepherd, it's not pastor, it's not evangelist, teacher, or prophet, or apostle. He's not saying those things. He's saying someone who proclaims the word. Because a lot of people say, well, we can't get this done without a preacher. That's not entirely true. A preacher might be more trained than you. But as long as you know. So then he goes on to say, and how shall they preach except what? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of and bring glad tidings of good things. Now, everything that we believe has to come by what you heard and more importantly, responding to what you heard. You can't deal with anything without responding to it. In other words, when Satan moves in your life, he needs you to respond to it. He doesn't have the power to force you to do stuff. When people say the devil made me do it, lies. Now let me tell you what can happen. Remember how Judas was dealing with Christ and he's like, we should have sold this perfume. How dare you put this on your feet and, and all this other stuff and anoint your body with it. We could have sold it. That was demonic oppression working on him. And remember the next uh, chapter, Jesus looks at him and says, one of y'all are going to betray me. And he looks at Judas and says, whatever you're going to do, hurry up and do it. Because we ain't chop, chop. We ain't got all day. Now you understand that the only, and the Bible says right after that, that Satan entered into his heart. Now, what you have to begin to realize is if you keep yielding yourself to demonic things, if you keep yielding yourself, he can't take over, but he can make you comfortable in it. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? He can't force you. But what he'll do is he'll make you comfortable in it so that you're used to it. Oh, this is just my lot in life. So things aren't working out well for you financially. Well, this is just the way it's been. How did you get there? Because it's constantly coming, and you're constantly hearing it, and more importantly, you're seeing it. And you'll see that faster than you'll see what the Word of God says, because you'll look at your circumstances and say, being in debt, not having, I can see that. God's saying, you could have this, you can be delivered, you can be set free, you can be... I just can't, I can't see it. Why can't you see it? Because I'm not living it and I don't believe it. And I don't believe it because I'm not living it. And I'm not living it because. Are y'all seeing it? So look at, look at uh, Matthew 12, verse 36, real quick. Is that from the time I started preaching or is that from the time we started service? Okay, give me a little bit more time. She's on bread. Y'all ridiculous back there. I'm like, good Lord, is that all I got? Y'all think y'all the pastor back there. Aren't we supposed to be changing clocks? We don't change clocks, but isn't everybody else supposed to change clocks today? Yeah, well, y'all get an extra hour today. <laughs> but I say, but I say, so, some in here are like, oh, God, please, no. <laughs> but I say unto you that every other word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Verse 37. For by you shall be, 
and by you shall be whose words he didn't say his he said yours by what you believe and that's the importance of it remember the parable of the talents he said you know the one who had one talent he said I knew you were a hard man so I hid it and he said you know what I'm going to do I'm going to judge you by your words you call me a hard man hard man is what you get you call me a good man good man is what you get The nature of God, I know I say this often, but it's really important revelation for you to understand. The nature of God is idiosyncratic to the believer. Whatever model you have put together about what you believe about God, you are going to experience. If you believe he's the deliverer, you're going to get delivered. If you believe he's the destroyer, you're going to be destroyed. Not by him. Because Satan is all too happy to jump in and play a role in your life. And this is why it's so important what church you go to. It's important what you're taught, how you're trained. Because so many people secularly think secularly. And because that's what they see, that's what they've been taught, that's what they've been trained. And then the word of God comes in and tries to upset the apple cart. And now the word of God's like, hey, look. This, what you thought it was, is not what it is. Well, I, I can't see it. <laughs> we know you can't see it. And the problem is because you can't see it, you don't think correctly. And because you don't think correctly, you don't believe correctly. And because you don't believe correctly, you don't speak correctly. And so as you begin to speak the wrong things, you experience the wrong things and then you see what you believe and not what you say because you don't believe it. Are y'all following where I'm going with this? Proverbs 11, or Proverbs uh, 13, 22. Proverbs 13, 22. I've been attending Stone Point Community Church for 11 years now and I absolutely love it. It's my church home. I have a three-year-old daughter named Mayana and it's extremely important for me to set the right example for her when it comes to honoring God with my finances. God has been so good to me with my business that tithing has given me a steady flow of income. I'm a hairstylist and I'm fully convinced that because I've been faithful with my tithing that my clients book appointments and come in like clockwork. Before they weren't seeing me as often, now they see me on a consistent basis even after doubling my price for my haircuts. My name is Ator Benjamin and this is my tithing testimony. And then it says, a good man leaves a to his, I have a question for you. If I'm leaving an inheritance to my children, that's X amount. Would you agree? If I leave it to my children's children, that's a lot more. Would you agree with me? So here's the question. Why didn't God say an evil man leaves an inheritance? Because money is evil. Having an abundance of it, having more than what you need that you can leave it to somebody else, that's got to be evil. But he says he's a good man. <laughs> God calls him a good man. Amen. Has enough left over that when he has eaten and thou art full and his life is now over, he has enough for not only just but his and he says, the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. And so many people think that when they say the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just, this is what they envision. They envision the wealth of the sinner falling out the sky. It was laid up. And whatever's up must... 
And God put that there and he just drops it out the sky. That's what they think. And so they're constantly, because this is how they believe, this is a result of how they think, thereby as a man thinketh, so then they speak these things, and guess what happens? Absolutely nothing. Because it's not what God said. Look at Deuteronomy 8.16. Uh, let's go 14. We got just a little bit of time. Then thy heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of... Who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein there were fiery and... I want you to mark a note in your Bible. Anytime you see serpents and scorpions, that means devils and demons. Devils and demons. He said, I led you through the wilderness and I led you through these serpents and scorpions, which are, again, allegorically speaking, he's speaking to devils and demons, or let me say it to you this way, the continual attacks that are waged against your life. And what? What's that? Lack? Lack. He said, I took you through all these attacks against your life and lack, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water. The hardest rock there is is flint. That's what you use to, to strike sparks. You sharpen steel with it. It's the hardest rock possible. Why do you think God brought water out of the hardest rock he possible? See, because if, if God had a, put a fish up on land and the fish squirted out water, you could say, oh, he's just in the water. And he just, that's how that happened. That's a natural thing. But God said, I'm going to do something that's going to show you that the impossible is possible so that when you measure what I say, you'll see it because you believe it because you'll realize that I am the God that can make water come out of Flint. I am the God that can split the Red Sea and let you walk over on dry land. I am the God that will visit you in the midst of the fiery furnace and you won't even smell like smoke. I'm the God that can do things you couldn't even imagine. I can set you free from things you couldn't even think of. All of that junk that Satan, all the serpents, the scorpions, the demons, the devils, all the things that Satan will try to hurl at you. And what you better believe is the more attacked you are, the more called of God you actually are. If you're sitting there like, I don't get attacked with nothing, that's because you don't do nothing. We need you, give. <laughs> but there's a group of people. <laughs> Satan been swinging at them almost all their life. They have not even seen a day where Satan hasn't reared his head and tried. But yet and still. <laughs> so watch what he says. Who might... Who brought you forth water out of the flint. Keep going. Who fed thee in the wilderness with which thy fathers knew not of. Can I ask you a question? Why not just feed them with stuff that's in the wilderness? Why not feed them with them snakes? Why give them something they've never seen before? Because he can. <laughs> See, if you was dealing with me, I'd have to figure out, okay, what can we eat? God said, <laughs> manna, <laughs> let's do that. You know how you know God's got a sense of humor? Have you ever seen a duck-billed platypus? <laughs> they have fangs on their feet. They got a bill like a duck and a tail... I just feel like God was up there like, you know what? (laughs) 
<laughs> he said, I fed you that he might do what? You know what humble means? To make you lower in your own estimation. Because, see, if I can make water come out of a rock, you now get a real understanding of how small you really are. <laughs> if I could feed you with something your fathers didn't know nothing about, you suddenly get a lower expectation of who you are. And God becomes, let them shout for joy and be glad. They that what? Favor my let them say continually, what? How do you magnify the Lord? You got to get smaller. You have to get smaller. And as you get smaller, God gets, watch what he says, that he might prove thee and do thee good at the latter end. You know what prove, uh, where I grew up on the East Coast, we had a place called Aberdeen Proving Grounds. And it was where they tested missiles and equipment and military things. They tested them on the proving grounds. Because you know what the proving grounds was? To prove it works. And God said, I did all this for you to test you. So that I could do you good. Think this through. Why would I have to test you to do you good? Let's think it through. Why would I need to test you so that I could do you good? Most of the time, if I give you a test, right, in all, in all of academia, we give you a test so you can demonstrate your knowledge of the subject so you can do yourself good. That's why you go to college. Somehow it benefits you, and you're supposed to get a better job, which the truth of the matter is typically you don't because academia has become a money machine. And there are people who have all kinds of degrees and all kinds of bills and flipping burgers. It's a sad state of affairs, but it is what it is. But the theory behind education was you go get an education, you be considered better at it, then you get paid because you are more skilled. God said, I did all of this for you, not so you can do yourself better, so that I could do it better. Because the moment you begin to realize and start measuring me correctly, I can do I can do more for you. Because when you start getting small and you start seeing me as big, I can do more for you. <laughs> when I test you and I want to see if I bless you, are you going to start pounding on your chest? On. Acting like you did something? Are you going to start acting like, oh, you too good? Or are you going to be like, Lord, I thank you. I don't deserve it, but I thank you. I didn't earn this, but I thank you. I'm not smart enough to pull this off, but I thank you. He said, if I test you in these things and you begin to realize who I am, I can do, do you good at the latter end. Watch. Verse 17. And thou say in thy heart, my power and the might of have gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. He's explaining it. He's saying the reason why I did all these miraculous, crazy things is to show you, you are nothing. Without me, you are nothing. Without God, when Satan starts pointing out all your weaknesses, look how you messed up. Look what you did. I, I did it. But with God. Because, see, he wants you to try yourself in light of yourself. But the moment you say, you know what, I might go out here tomorrow and still mess up. But that does not change my relationship with God. Because I'm learning and I'm growing, and I'm working on my measuring skills, and I'm learning how to measure God and to take him at his word. And everybody who's ever done anything for God has had to go through some stuff for God. So that you learn that it's the end of me is the beginning of him. The moment I make the decision, I refuse 
to allow myself to think more highly of myself than I ought. But to allow God and measure him greater than me. Because greater is he that is in And so watch what he says. He says, Thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee what? Can I ask you a question? I, I, wanna, I, I want to gingerly tap dance on this for just a moment. If you would just allow me uh, the ability to do so. Why would you need a power to get wealth? All you got to do is rob people, steal people, hurt people. Why would you need a power to get it? God said, I'll give you a power to get wealth so that you don't have to do. So if it's a power, y'all, then it's got to be an anointing. And if it's an anointing, then it has to be spiritual. Which is why he said a good man leaves an inheritance. So then are you telling me that as a believer, because he's speaking to Israel, and there are many people, I won't call them theologians because they're not. They're parking lot theologians. will say, well, we're not Israel. Lies. Absolute Lies. We, in fact, are the Israel that he's talking about. <laughs> and so if you think that all blood Jews are going to heaven, you are sadly mistaken. They're still going to have to make a decision for Christ. People get this all made. I ain't got time to do all that, y'all. You, we, we taught a covenant class. Take it at LPCU. <clears throat> But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he unto thy, as it is this day. So then evidently, to establish his covenant, it must take wealth. Why would he need to give it to you? Why not just say, I'll give you love? <laughs> Genesis 128. Any amplified classic, please. Genesis 128. And the Amplified Classic. And God blessed them and said to them, Be, multiply, fill the earth, and do me a favor. Everybody, read this together. Using all its vast resources in the service of and in the service of God and man. So what are you supposed to be doing? Using the vast resources. He gave you a power. He gave you an anointing to get it. And he told you from the very beginning, your job is to take all the resources of this world and use it for the service of and of then why do we have such poverty thinking in the body of Christ? I know nobody in here thinks that way. So I'm preaching to convert it. I know that. But tell me why people don't understand our responsibility was given from the very beginning. This was his plan and his design was for us to use all the resources here in the service of God and in the service of mankind. Look at uh, 3 John 2. Third John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest and be in even... Now remember, this is where we left off. This is the place where people don't understand that your health your deliverance, your uh, uh, prosperity, your walk with God will never be greater than what your soul tells you. Wherever your soul is, your mind, your will, and your emotions, that's the place 
where you will constantly dwell in harassment, in oppression, in lack. It's in the way you think. And he said, when your soul comes up, you'll respond differently. When your soul, your mind, will, and emotions come up. See, because emotions will shipwreck you every time. People say, oh, well, I just, I feel like, I didn't ask you how you felt. We all feel different ways. Dear God, if I only did what I feel, I'd be eating Cheetos, watching TV all day long. But I'm not going to do what I feel. I do what I know. And if I understand what he's saying here, he's saying that the level of prosperity that I have in my life, and prosperity is not limited to money. I want you to be very, very clear about that. Because a lot of people, when you hear prospering or prosperity, they assume that it only means money. When you say the peace of God, what is the word for the peace of God? Shalom. What does shalom mean? Nothing missing, nothing broken. When God says he wants you to prosper, he wants nothing missing. Nothing in your life broken. You know that car you keep trying to piece together? Chow's broken. <laughs> you know that, that, that stuff you be thinking? There'd be all kinds of wild child that's broken <laughs> y'all, y'all about to give me to sing a negro spiritual right about now oh. <laughs> child wait in the water <laughs> it's broken y'all <laughs> And I want you to understand something. God doesn't desire that for you. And he says that as your soul, as your mind, will, and emotions begin to prosper, so do you. Because when you start thinking different, okay. I ignored it twice and it came back, so he is persistent and I'm with him. Just want to make sure it was him before I did it. All right. Um, where are we going here? Whew. Y'all feel that? Yeah, it's good. Um, I believe it's Mark 6. No, it is Mark 5. We're going to... Verse 9. During this break, you can pull out your phone to leave a review on our Facebook page. Let us know about your experience here at Stone Point. Also, if you haven't already, be sure to leave one for us on Google as well. We're really looking forward to hear what you have to say about Stone Point. For the sake of time, how many of y'all know the story of Madman and Gadara? Jesus is dealing with this madman. He's running around. Okay. Verse 1. Verse 1. I'm like, I might as well just, because telling the story is just going to be the same as reading the story. And they came over to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. No man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked us under by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. Question for you. If he had the ability to break out of chains and he was this big, you know, Lou Ferrigno, Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of looking dude and he busted these chains, would anybody have paid attention? So he had to be scrawny dude. 
And yet he had the ability to have power to bust out those chains. Where did that power come from? The unclean spirit. So then are you telling me his power was spiritual in nature? But then God said he gave you a power. See, what people don't understand is all power is spiritual in nature. All of it. So here he is. He's busting out of pieces. Keep going. And always, night and day. Which means what? He couldn't sleep. Oh, my God. And people think, people think like things like insomnia or my inability to sleep. They think, oh, that's, that's okay. It's just, you know, I'm going through something. They'll see their kids cutting themselves. Look at it. Cutting, crying all the time. Crying all the time. Crying. And cutting himself with all these things. People will attribute to natural things. Oh, we just got to medicate. I'm not, I don't have a problem with medication. I think some people do need to be medicated. I do. As long as it's prescription. Medication. And not from the earth. Because <laughs> God put a lot of things here, but he didn't put it here, everything here for me and you. God put arsenic here. I don't see you... It's so good arsenic. Anyway. Y'all don't talk to me. I'm on one today. <laughs> so he's crying, cutting himself with stones. And then people think, well, my kid's been cutting themselves. Oh, it's just a fad. Go, look, let me show you. Let me show you. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him. And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torments me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou... Keep going. And asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is... For... You ever run into these people that their pronouns are they... Told you it's going to be heavy. I, I prefer to be called they. Why? Because we are many. So let's go back to verse 2. With an unclean spirit, verse 3. Who had his dwelling among the tombs, no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Keep going. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, the chains had plucked us, un plucked us under by him, and the fetters broken to pieces, neither could any man tame him. Now I want to ask you a question. There is no answer to this question. There is no answer, there's no exact answer because the Bible doesn't tell us. But I want you to think about something just for a second. Use your sanctified imagination for just a moment. And I don't think this is a hermeneutical overreach. I think it'll help you just understand something. Ready? Which demon, I wonder, gave him the strength to break those chains? Next. Which demon, I wonder, kept him up all night? Which demon, I wonder, had him crying all the time? Which demon, I wonder, had him cutting himself with stones? Keep going. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice, said, What do I do to thee, Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. I wonder which demon said that. And then he said, come out, thou unclean spirit. Keep going. And he asked him, what's your name? And they answered? Oh, he answered. So one demon. Oh. I wonder which one that was. He said, because for we are many. So I wonder which demonic oppression... Because sometimes people can become so consumed that they don't even know, am I he, she, they, them, is it we, is it us? And none of them fought with each other. 
None of them say, hey, listen, dummy, you spoke last time. How come I can't speak? You over here talking about who we are. There's no division among them. You want to find division, you got to come to the church. For we are, keep going. And besought him much that he should not send them away, but cast them, or send them away out of the, keep going. And there was nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. So this is a large herd, a great herd. Great herd meaning large, not tasty, great, large, herd. Let's just say for the sake of discussion, a large herd of, of swine is maybe 100. What would you say, maybe 200? When he cast all those demons out, they all went into those pigs and the pigs ran off the cliff. So that means there had to be at least 200, maybe 100. Let's just say it was 50. 50 demons are inside one man attacking him, getting him to do all of these things. Y'all sure you got it? So then, if your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions are easily swayed by demonic things, you can't be possessed, but you can be influenced. Now all of a sudden, your emotions become uncontrollable. And you've learned to get people's attention by using your emotions. And it's influenced by the things that seek expression. You ever wonder, I, I, let me speak on myself. I have always wondered initially why people would be so mad at me that I don't even know. I walk into a store, people are mad at me. I'm like, did you have a bad day? What I, did I do something to you? It's, un, it's unnormal, isn't it? And here's what I've learned. Just the same way that God seeks expression in you from his spirit, he seeks you to have the fruit of the spirit and to be express himself through you, love, gentleness, kindness, right? He, he wants to express himself through you. So does Satan. And I slowly began to learn that the reason why people hate me is because Satan hates me. And anybody that belongs to him or is yielded to him is going to hate me. And you've got to learn that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. That, that helps you to understand, I am not going to dot their I and cross their T. Because it ain't them. As soon as I walk away, somebody else walks up and like, hey, how you doing? So good to see you. They have no idea that they're being influenced. And so what we have to begin to see is how dangerous it really is to not allow your head to think straight. That's why he said, take heed to how you measure it. He said, if you don't get this principle, you won't get any of them. He said, because everything you do has to do with how... Now, now watch Hebrews 4.12. <clears throat> So man operates in three dimensions, right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is three. We were created in his image. So we're three-part beings. You are a spirit. You live in a body. And you possess a soul. If someone passes on, their body is not them. Their body was an earth suit. That earth suit gave them license to function here on earth. And to give expression. How many of you remember the story Kenneth Hagin Sr. told when he was on his deathbed and he felt himself leave his body? And he was literally talking to his grandmother. And when he was speaking to her, uh, he started the sentence and then he literally physically left his body and he's looking down at his body and she's sitting there like waiting for him to finish speaking. He stopped speaking. So then he felt something pull him back into his body. And when he went back into his body, his mouth caught up with where his spirit was and finished the sentence. Minus the part he said when he was up looking at himself. 
I need you to see this. A person passes away. There's just a body. And it's amazing how many people uh, relish over the body. They spend goo gobs of money to protect and worship the body. When the person's a spirit, they're gone. They are not there. You can kick it, punch it. You can flip it upside down, burn it, whatever you want to do. They're not there. But we go back and memorialize. (laughs) Are you seeing this? So if you're a soul, then you would be mind and emotions, which you are not. If you were your body, when your body died, you would die with it. Your spirit. You live in a body and you possess a soul. So if your mind and your, let me say it this way. If your soul and spirit were the same thing, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing slender of and the joints and, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your, let me ask you this. If your soul and your spirit are one and the same, how could they be divided? The reason why I want you to understand is because a lot of people think my spirit will do it. God, put it in my spirit. And what you don't understand is your soul's keeping it from doing it. Your mind, will, and emotions are too wild. You won't control your own mind. So what God reveals to your spirit, your soul is beating it out of it. Because you keep measuring it through your intellect. God told me I can go across the Red Sea. Great, let's do it. Well, wait a minute. What are we going to do? The Red Sea is there and I can't swim. There's mountains on every side. Pharaoh's army is breathing down my neck so hot I can feel it. The soul says, you're done. The soul says, you're going to die. How you measure things. That's why if you don't get your mind straight and possess your soul and keep your soul from affecting your spirit, because he just said they go so close to each other, like joints and marrow, and it's the discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In other words, the only thing, please, 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 please hear me. The only thing that can get your spirit and your soul in line with each other is the Word of God. That's why he said stop measuring stuff through your soul. Quit trying to say, I can't see it. Because because you can't see it, your soul is in control. And you have now negated the word of God because of your soul. And you're thinking, well, I'm not growing spiritually. No, you're not growing in your soul. Your spirit is as saved as it'll ever be. If you've confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you died instantly, you are going to heaven. You're going to heaven stupid, but you're going. And I don't know about you, but if my soul and my spirit run so close together that it takes the word to split it, you better be careful what you keep claiming God told you. Well, pastor, God told me that. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. God told me so-and-so husband is my future husband. No, he didn't. He did not. How do you know? It doesn't line up with the word. Well, I know that's what he said. No, that's what your flesh said. That's what your mind told you. And do you see how your mind now can limit how you measure? Because you can't, you can't measure the word of God, which is infinite, by a brain that is finite. Are y'all starting to see it? So when he starts to tell you, because here's the problem. So many people are so intellectual. I was one of these people. I was so intellectual. You had to intellectually explain to me. You pray in tongues. What is that? Quit messing around. That's just a bunch of syllables. 
I had to, I have to intellectually understand and discern that how this all operates and functions because it doesn't make any sense to me. Miracles, I mean, miracles, really? God does miracles? Help me understand how it happened. I need to know scientifically. Explain it to me. We were in a meeting. Uh, one of the first meetings I ever did with Michael back in the day. That's how I met him. We were in a meeting, and a lady came up, young lady, pregnant, I don't know, seven, eight months pregnant, something like that, and they said that they told her the baby was dead. She went to two doctors. Both of them said the same thing. Now they were trying to figure out what they were going to do. They were just going to induce labor or go in and get it because the baby's in there dead. We laid hands on her. The power of God hit her. It wasn't, what, three months later? I have a picture of me holding that baby. When she went back, listen, listen, I didn't do it, so don't clap for me. Raise your hands and worship God. God did it. I got nothing to do with it. I'm an idiot. Trust me. I know me. You know, if you call yourself one, you, you know yourself, right? Okay. You should believe me. But God worked in such a way. When she went back, they said, we don't know what to say here. She went in for the surgery to induce and deliver this stillborn fetus. And they said, we just don't know what to say. Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. See, I, w- I want you to begin to understand. You can't. I'm, I, was, I was the guy. Well, I need to understand how that happened. <laughs> and then I learned something from a lesser known character in the Bible. When they asked him, they said, what happened here? He said, I I really don't know. He said, all I can tell you is I was blind. And Jesus made the difference. See, see that whole concept of they asked him, how did you get healed? He said, I don't know. He said, all I know is I was harassed. I was blind. I was sick. I was struggling. I was in fear. I was in poverty. I was in lack. All I know is what I was, and this is the difference, and Jesus is the one who worked it out. I, 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 listen, I've learned. I've learned. I had to get out of my intellect and stop thinking intellectually. I was in a, a prayer meeting one time. I was in a prayer meeting at a church. So now, you know, and I wasn't pastoring. I just, I just I got invited, so I went. And I'm sitting there, and all these people are praying. We're, we're in a room, probably no bigger than this, this first section of the row here. There's about 10 of us in there. And um, this girl, she's praying, and she starts uh, convulsing. And she starts screaming. She starts crying. And, and so I'm looking around. <laughs> it ain't my prayer meeting. Right? I mean, listen, when you're in somebody else's house, you do as, you know, when in Rome, you do as Romans do, right? So I get invited to this prayer meeting. It is not my prayer meeting. I'm not in charge. I'm just there. And I'm watching. And then she falls on the ground. And she's writhing on the ground. I'm like. (laughs) And everybody's looking around. So I'm like, okay, well, we're not going to put up with this much longer. So I get up. We deal with it. Once we deal with it, it leaves, she's at peace. And they're like, the heck just happened here? I ain't coming to this prayer meeting no more. They told too much. You can't explain stuff like that. You just cannot explain stuff like that. And let me tell you what happened. By the Spirit of God, the Lord began to reveal to me some things. So I spoke it to her. Come to find out she was in a car accident. Her mother was in the car with her. And her mother died and she didn't. Now I want you to pay very close attention. She began to feel guilty because while her mother was in the hospital before she had passed, she kept saying to the Lord, take me and not her. So when her mother passed, she then got it in her 
And Satan is all too willing. All right, I'm going to give you another one real quick. Another story. Illustrates the point. You ready? They did a survey. And the survey was they had a very uh, uh, attractive woman who was at an amusement park. And she just walked up to random men and said, Hi, my name is so-and-so. And she rattled off her phone number and walked away. She did this multiple times, and they took tally of it, right? They walked up to the man right after she did it and said, hey, what was her name? What was her number? They were like, we have no idea. She then went up to men who had just came off a roller coaster that had gotten the Jesus scared out of them. <laughs> and she did the exact same thing to those who had just come off of those, the scariest roller coasters. Do you know majority of those mem- men remembered her name and her number? And see, so you think it's cute for Halloween to watch Halloween movies be scared out of your wits. I love me a horror flick. More babies have been procreated after horror flicks for a reason. Playerology 101. Because the first thing she going to do when she gets freaked out. <clears throat> you could be snaggle tooth. Your hair could run down the back of your head because it's running from your face. And people have no idea what they're playing with. No clue. No clue. They think, oh, it's just, you sure? What is it opening, it up, uh, opening you up to? Right. Yeah. What is it making you, your heart? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And they said the only thing <laughs> that is able to tell you whether it's your head or whether it's God yeah. is what does the Word of God say. Amen. And the more you learn This is why you have to be careful judging people who ain't there yet. Well, you know, I I can't believe that he came dressed to church like that. His pants so tight he could sit on a piece of bubble gum and tell you what flavor it is. So what? So what? It is what it is. Golly, you see that dress she Jezebel? So what? It is what it is. The Bible says a man is righteous as he understands his righteousness. And if you would give them the time and the patience to sit and learn the word of God, they'll come out victorious. And the truth of the matter is, while you still sitting there judging them, they'll be doing great things for God. Then you'll be jealous, wondering how did that happen? Because you can't have what you judge. Simple. Be up to date with the latest sermons and listen to Stone Point Community's podcast. It's also a quick and easy way to share these messages with your friends and family. Stay inspired throughout your week and listen. And so that's why he said the word of God. Because the word of God is everything. The word of God will reveal the things that need to be revealed. The word of God will help people. There, listen, it's great to get them saved. There, there's that thing, oh, let's just get them saved. No, we can't just get them saved. If we get them saved and we don't teach them what they need to know, they'll fall back into the hands of Satan. And now it's even worse. Remember he said when the house is swept clean? He said when it comes back and doesn't find anything in there, it brings more. This is why you got to train them. you got to teach people. you got to be patient enough to teach them. That's why he said those that are spiritual, restore somebody. You know what that means? Those who ain't going to judge. Those who ain't going to point fingers. You know, the mature ones are the ones who can restore other people. Because you can't restore nobody you condemn. You can't. How do you bring restoration for somebody that you point your fingers at all the time? One of the greatest lessons God's ever taught me is I don't care what you think, you move with what I think. 
And whenever those things contradict each other, I choose his way. And it's never failed me. Ever. Not one time. Are y'all with me? Let's all stand up. I, I'm not done, but I had to find a place to land. <laughs> or else we would be here an extra hour. Thank you for listening to today's message. I hope you'll subscribe so you can receive the latest podcast to keep encouraged and inspired all through the week. Help us to continue to share the message of hope with those all around the world. Visit scc.church or click the link in the description to partner with us today. We hope you share this message with a friend and be sure to follow us on social media. We're praying for you. I know God's best is still ahead. We will see you next time.